pragmatic. So the language design act could put stuff into the language that would allow the programmer, if he's a sophisticated, he or she is a sophisticated programmer and understands what is required to solve this problem, can put pragmas in that can direct the compiler to then direct the hardware to more efficiently use the resources to get things, in, things done quicker. The compiler way. So it'd be nice if, uh, so I have this slide when I teach the uh, introduction to architecture, is uh, how do I get computers to run faster? Well, I need instructions coming in very, very fast, and I need data that's always available. So the instructions involve a 100% branch predictor, a perfect eye cache, I'm never taking uh, packet breaks when I go to the eye cache for, for fetches, what about the data? Data, that's simple. It's all I need is infinite capacity, single cycle memory. That'd be good. Infinite capacity, single cycle memory. Go to the cache, uh, memory if you will, grab it. Can't do that. So what do I do? I do a cache hierarchy. <clears throat> when I get started, we have one level of cache. I don't know how many levels of cache we're going to get up. As the latency to memory gets bigger and bigger, we put more and more layers of cache. You know, we have a single cycle cache or a two cycle cache, and then we have a five cycle cache, or a ten cycle cache, because we're trying to bridge this thing so that most of the time it takes very little time to get stuff from memory. How are we going to accomplish that? Well, how about if the compiler, we raise, in fact, we've done that to a small extent, with uh, the fetch opcode, which doesn't do any useful work. It just makes sure that the data is in the first level cache before uh, uh, the instruction that needs that data uh, gets it. We have a load instruction. And we take cache misses all the way up to memory. It takes us hundreds of cycles to get that data. Well, how about a fetch instruction that the compiler can then prefetch the instructions and it prefetches from memory to the third level, say, to the second level, to the first level, so that when that instruction that needs that data does the load, it's in the first level cache. You know, owner invented run ahead execution for out of order machines many years ago as a way of improving the latency when I have, when I get a cache miss. And that cache misses caused the reorder buffer to fill, and now it just stands around waiting until the hundreds of cycles later the data comes back. Another approach to getting, uh, uh, to not wasting the time that is to solve the latency problem. He didn't solve the bandwidth problem, he solved the latency problem. The compiler can help. So you would move data in so that it's there in that first level cache when you need it, and then move it back out so that it's freeing up the space that's in that first level cache when you no longer need it. Unfortunately, in the old days, that was easy to think in terms of because energy was not a consideration. Now, energy is a consideration, so we have to judiciously move data. But if we do, and if we can, then we work toward the latency a dynamic recompilation. So while the, that, that started and needs to be done much more, I think that may be one of the best benefits of uh, SMT machines is that I have threads. The application only has one thread, but it's running like a dog. And so I can have this thread that works on the program, not on the solving of the program of the problem of the program but rather on figuring out the best way to solve that problem that is recompiling the code so that it may be when the code was first compiled and when it's first compiled it uses profiling sure but is the data representative and do we have phase changes if the data is not representative or if we do have phase changes then the compiler is not going to uh, do the job but we could recompile dynamically. 
and we recompile so that we can solve this latency problem of what is taking longer than it needs to. Uh, one of my students came up with wish branches when she was a PhD student, Hessen Kim, who's now a tenured associate professor at Georgia Tech. Wish branch is another example. You know, one of the things you don't want to do is branch misprediction because, you know, things go to hell and you have to, you've gone down this path and whoops, we made a mistake, wait and see, and now we have to go down the uh, correct path. And she said, hey, you know, we, we'd really like to not mispredict. Uh, and if the prediction accuracy is not great, then we should be doing branch prediction. We should be doing predication. But we can't always do predication. That's a function of what the code looks like. You know, here's a branch, and we have these 10,000 instructions. Uh, we have these 10,000 instructions before we hit the bridge point. Not going to do predication. So her, wish, her, her work, one of the things that she did was say, wait a minute, at compile time, let's look at the code. Does predication make sense if, in fact, our branch predictor is not doing so well today? And if it doesn't, if predication does make sense, well, then we will set up the code so that at runtime, when we know whether the branch predictor is actually working or not, we can uh, either do branch prediction, where we don't have to pay the penalty of another uh, flow dependency because of the predicate, or we do predication where we don't have to pay the even worse penalty of a uh, misprediction. At the architecture layer, the dense encoding the instructions. You know, one of the great things about dense encoding the instructions is they take up less space uh, in the cache. You know, some people say memory is cheap. Yeah, memory is cheap. Memory bandwidth is not cheap. So going back and forth between the chip and the memory is problematic. Make the code denser. In fact, this notion that microcode is bad is silly. Microcode is good. Right? You dense encode the instructions, and then when, it, when it's time for them to deliver, they're blown up into the microcode to solve the problem. And we save the latency of taking a, of not having to take a cache miss and go out of chip. So dense encoding instructions, that's at the ISA level. The EMT instruction I already gave you. A large scratch pad, I don't see, I don't know why that's not uh, being done more, but I think it's a, it's a natural. Scratch pad. I'm not talking about memory, I'm talking about registers. So how many registers should you have? I don't know, a thousand, two thousand? Why not? Okay. <clears throat> the compiler people know all about register spills. Yeah. And it wastes a lot of time writing that stuff up. If you have a thousand registers, well, that could save you. And it's not part of the memory system, so there's no coherence problem or anything. It's like register one, two, three, or I guess in our community, uh, EAX, CDX, and ECX. I guess that, no, I guess that's old, so now it's the ARM uh, uh, meaning of these registers. But the point is, why don't we have a large scratch pad as part of the ISA? So those are the layers, or some of the layers. The other layer is the microarchitecture layer. And there's a lot of things we can do with the microarchitecture layer to improve on latency. I've got a few of them on the board. So uh, Ivan Sutherland is one of the brightest guys I've ever met. Um, and he's still kicking uh, into his 80s now. Uh, he wants to design asynchronous machines. The whole machine should be asynchronous. No clock. Why would you ever have a clock, you know? Let things happen when they're ready to happen. You know, I scratch my, uh, my brain on that one. I don't know how to design an asynchronous machine. In fact, when you were a student, uh, one of your uh, fellow students uh, did a master's thesis on an I.O. controller, which he designed and built the asynchronous circuit for the I.O. controller. It had something like four states. It was a very simple thing. And he wasted six months debugging a four-state asynchronous machine. No, asynchronous machine have, uh, has uh, uh, hazards. 
not this silliness that we redefine the meaning of the word hazard. I mean real hazards where the propagation delays can kill you. But if I go asynchronous, then I don't have to pay the penalty of the cycle, every clock cycle. So why not have asynchronous for a while and then sync? So this thing is going to take three cycles. So the microarchitecture layer, I can build the engine to take three cycles, and then I sync. And I've saved a lot of time. I've improved on uh, latency. Uh, big cores and little cores. We're starting to get that. We've been talking about that in my group now for, what, 15 years. Uh, we called it uh, asymmetric chip multiprocessors. Now they call it heterogeneous cores. And the idea is you have some heavyweight and you have some lightweight. When do you use each? The microarchitecture can help you and it works on latency. A uh, simplest example is Amdahl's law. So during most of the part of Amdahl's law, everything is running great in parallel. All of a sudden, you hit the Amdahl bottleneck. Well, you don't want to run with one of these lightweight cores, one of these little cores. You want to take this thing and hand it off to the big core. Get past that bottleneck quicker. It saves latency. How about parallel applications? We've got a critical section. Critical section, a data structure that you have to access mutually exclusively. So all these threads are working, everything's fine, then they hit the critical section. Now they have to stand in line and one by one go through the critical section. How about if we shift the threads to the big core to get through that critical section faster? And then one by one they can all get through that critical section faster. And since the critical section is involving a data structure that is probably kept in the cache, I'm not going to get cache misses because the data that is needed by each of these threads in the critical section is in that cache of that one new core. And so I can save latency. The accelerators I already talked about, and I gave you uh, the example of uh, you can do it in microcode, better yet, do it in FPGA, better still. Do it with an ASIC. ASICs are wonderful. You can't improve on latency better than with an ASIC. Unfortunately, we're in the science of trade-offs in computer architecture, and so uh, anytime you have something good, you have to give on something bad, and ASICs can only do the one thing that they can do good. And so it's only good for that one thing. How important is it to do that one thing? Well, it depends. But if it is important, then building an ASIC into the chip to do that one thing could be a win. Use of dark silicon, there may be a place to use those ASICs. If I have 50 billion transistors, I can't keep them all powered on at the same time. How about using a lot of them to build ASICs that are doing functionality that it's not required all the time, but when it's required, you really want it to do. I mentioned the AMD 29000, that priority encoder. Priority encoder is not really a lot of watching. But how about if you have a function, I don't know, fast Fourier transform maybe. You have a, a function that requires a lot of logic, but it's only needed some of the time. 50 billion transistors? Even with 5 billion transistors, I can build it. And I build all these things. And they all improve on latency when they're needed. So the proper use of dark silicon, not powering on all the transistors all the time, which is a given. Everybody knows that we're not going to be able to power on that number of uh, transistors at the same time. Allocation of shared resources. So I've got these shared resources on the chip, and every core or every thread that's running on its core wants everything that's best for it. Well, that doesn't work. We call that chaos. But it is okay to have each core running its thread know what it needs and then send it to some arbiter, which is part of the microarchitecture, will decide who gets what in order to make all the threads uh, have products. 
So each core wants to decrease its latency. It knows how to do it, but I need an arbiter in the microarchitecture to decide who gets what. Uh, Prefetching may be done by SSMT, that is, uh, threads that are part of the SMT machine that are not working on the application, but working on the infrastructure to know when to prefetch. Improving the prefetchability, which allows the, uh, the machine to execute the program faster. Our branch prediction, not having to go down the wrong path and take that misprediction penalty, which slows the machine down enormously. Uh, near neighbor communication, we have reached the point where, in fact, we reached the point a long time ago where if I compute something over here on the chip and the result is needed over here on the chip, I can't get it from here to here and then do some work on it over here in the same cycle. So the pipeline has to have stages where I take it from here and I put it here, and that's all that stage does is move the data, spending a lot of energy. And so near neighbor communication, something that the microarchitect can do in designing the machine that I produce the result, I use it here. I don't have to waste those cycles to move it where it's needed because where it's needed is right here. In a very limited sense, that idea came up a long time ago. H.T. Kung, this is Dalek Arrays, 1979. But it hasn't been exploited the way it needs to be exploited. <clears throat> and it saves you energy, and it improves on latency. Because you produce the thing and then bingo, you use it right next door. No time at all to move that data from here to here. And here to here is getting, uh, has to be faster and faster uh, with the frequencies that we currently run at. And then finally, the runtime system, which I think is an opportunity that we absolutely have to do. Runtime system people think of as part of the operating system. Part of the operating system. So here I am on the chip, and I can build into the circuits, or into the microcode, these uh, threads that are not working on the algorithm, monitoring that's more than just a set of counters. It's figuring out what's busy, what's not busy, when do I go to the big core, when do I stay with the small cores, all that monitoring stuff on the chip. And now what I want to do is take that monitoring information and kick it up to the operating system. Operating system is way up here in my layers. And the operating system is going to make the decision and then back down. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, uh, I flew into uh, Istanbul yesterday. And it turns out owner flew into Istanbul yesterday. And when owner flew in, and he had to go through immigration, he went immediately to the counter. And it wasn't a matter of whether he was carrying a Turkish passport or a US passport. Didn't matter, he could go right to the counter. So if he was doing that on-chip monitoring, he would telephone me or text message me on my, uh, while I'm on the airplane, because I get in an hour later, and say, you know, the immigration line is fast. You can go right from when you get off the plane, after you take that two mile hike from the plane to the immigration, and bingo, you go right through. Except there was a problem, see? He went through the immigration line an hour before my plane landed. So he sends me this email, a text message, saying, immigration is two minutes. Except in that hour, a lot more planes landed. So immigration took me 45 minutes. So his ability to be monitoring when he got off the plane and let me know that I'm not getting off for an hour later doesn't do me any good because a lot can happen in that time. So the monitoring equipment is there on the chip telling you what's busy and what's not busy. Make a decision. We've got a different world. So why not have the runtime system be part of the chip? Why not have the algorithm people writing the program know something about the behavior of what 
needed to get that program done, put trackers into the language. Then the compiler people, they take that program and looking at that practice, they can generate procedure calls to the runtime system. And so that as the program is being executed by the hardware, there are these regular procedure calls. And the job of the procedure call is to look at what the monitoring has provided on the chip, not way up here in the operating system, but on the chip, and making those decisions right away to better take advantage of the shared resources. Not later on when the, when the state of the hardware processing has changed, but right away. And it's clear to me that the runtime system to be effective in decreasing latency and exploiting the available resources. You know, how many times have you been in a line in the supermarket and you're behind somebody that's taking forever, and damn it, in the middle of forever, this person realizes that she forgot milk. And so she stops everything, goes to the back of the store to get milk, and there you are. And so what do you do? You look at the other lines and you switch lines, because the resource availability at the other lines is empty, and you can get through the supermarket and on your way much faster. That's what latency is all about. And I think we have a shot at the runtime system in the near term to do that. So, that's what I have to say today. And uh, I got through early, which is good. Uh, I think there's lots of opportunity and the supercomputing community needs to worry about latency as much as we have historically worried about bandwidth if we really want to, you know, cure cancer or predict tsunamis, etc. Thank you. Okay, we have plenty of time for questions. Or plenty of time for more coffee if they want. But, uh, ah, we've got a question. You have to speak up because I'm yeah. old and can't hear. Yeah. Oh, look at this. We're going to have a. Uh... Does it work? Does it work? No idea how it's enabled. Maybe I'll just speak up. Okay. So, so we're talking about supercomputing here. I cannot hear. Okay. Come close. <laughs> If they can't hear also, I will read yeah. for them. So, so we are talking about supercomputing here, yeah. and then, I mean, presumably, all the cores in the chip are going to be active. All the cores in the chip are going to be accessed, maybe. I mean, they're going to be active in order to do the computation faster. So, basically, all those cores are going to go to the memory. So, when when we have to consider memory into the picture, does it get that? bandwidth becomes more